Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Dear listeners, Assalamu alaikum. A very good evening. Welcome back to Friday Night Fusion, the new sound of Great Britain broadcasting live and interactive on 93.5 Unity FM in Birmingham, 105.1 Inspire FM Luton, 107.8 Radio Ikhlas, Derby, Passion Islam.com, and via our various media partners up and around the United Kingdom. The escalation of violence in Israel slash Palestine has been one of an interesting and truly tragic nature over the past few days. Israel argues that it has been forced to do what it has done in the Gaza Strip because of the significant threat that has been posed to its national security. For the first time in many years, we have seen rockets, Israel argues, fired by militants in Palestine, reaching the northern parts of of Israel, namely Tel Aviv, which is a heavily populated area. They say that the action they have taken is reasonable considering the circumstances. However, the people of Palestine and Palestinian activists accuse the Israelis of inhumane breaches of national and international law. They say that the Israeli actions cannot be justified in any way, shape or form. They argue that the Israelis are not killing terrorists but innocent Palestinians that have done nothing wrong. So as you can tell, there are strong feelings on both sides, both sides that today we aim to speak to. Joining me on the line, I have Professor Jonathan Rosenhead from the London School of Economics and Political Science, Chair of the British Committee for the Universities of Palestine, and I also have Professor Mortachai Kader, a senior Israeli academic and someone who spent over 25 years as a senior commander in the Israeli Defense Force and someone who still has a connection with the IDF today. Thank you both for joining us this evening. First and foremost, if I could start off with yourself, Professor Kida, a lot of people accuse the Israeli Defense Force and the Israelis in general once again for executing a truly inhumane attack upon the people of Palestine. They point to the fact that many people who have been killed are rather young. Is this what has happened on this occasion? Well, this is as far as could be from the reality. Uh, Israel is attacking uh, terrorists. Who are launching missiles, and yes, and today they actually launched another terrorist attack on a bus in Israel. We try to point target those terrorists while they are trying to target our men, women, children, old people, and young as well. And this is the basic difference. We pay our, our utmost efforts to restrict our hits to only to those who hit us and the storages which they hide behind children and behind women and behind uh, civilians, while we try to target only these. And this is the basic difference between Israel as a state and those terrorists who view us as the people who are the the sons and children of apes and uh, swines, as they actually say in the Hamas charter, which can be even read in English as well. However, Professor Kida, a lot of people may say that an 11-month-old baby, a 2-year-old child, these people can't be terrorists or connected with any form of terrorism whatsoever, can they? Yet Israel has actually been responsible for killing children as young as a few months old in Gaza over the past few days. Uh, These children, unfortunately, uh, are near storages of missiles which those terrorists deliberately hide in places populated by these little children. So if we hit the storage, no doubt some children will be uh, uh, hit uh, around the place. And they deliberately do it because they show those children in the media and everybody in the world uh, identifies with their, uh, or sympathizes with their agony, but by they actually hide the fact that they were hiding behind those children and hiding missiles and other ammunition and weapons in the same houses where people are living. Professor Jonathan Rosenhead, Israel strongly argues that it has had to launch the attacks that it has launched because of the threat to their national security that has been created over the past few days. They regard their actions as very much reasonable considering the circumstances. Surely the 
national security of Israel needs to be taken into account in this crisis rather than, as Israel argues, them being unfairly targeted on a regular basis when these instances do break out? Well, I'm just, uh, I'm sure most of your listeners will have been amazed at this Alice through the looking glass picture of what's going on that Professor Kida has given. The idea, for example, that the um, Palestinians are, are putting their children as human shields. I am not accusing the Israeli Air Force, etc., of deliberately targeting children. I'm accusing them of carrying out a policy of bombing in one of the most densely populated areas in the world where children will inevitably be killed. And it, it is this policy. As to a threat to security, the threat to security which Hamas, uh, Islamic Jihad, and, uh, and the other people who send rockets represent is entirely because Israel has refused to make any negotiations whatsoever with the democratically elected government of, of, of Gaza. And uh, they have produced a situation in which there is nothing that the Hamas and the people of Gaza can do to try to overcome the, uh, the siege, which has been now crippling Gaza for five years, except these rather futile, these rather inaccurate rockets, which are confronting the might of the fourth biggest army in the world. I mean, you have to get real about what's happening now. However, Professor Rosenhead, a lot of people may argue that Hamas and many Arab nations that neighbor Israel could make a very good start in accepting the UN resolution passed in 1948, which they rejected, which actually marked the establishment of the State of Israel. Some may argue that this pulverization on both sides has been down to the fact that neither party has been willing to accept each other. Other. Shouldn't Hamas and other Arab states begin to accept Israel as a state in order for them to engage in dialogue? Because whatever side you're on, the situation is rather severe over there. People are dying on both sides and people are living in fear as the hours go by. What you're referring to are the, the, the famous three no's which the Arab governments gave in 1948. But that was 1948. We're, we're talking now 65 years on. There is every evidence that many of the Arab governments are willing to negotiate, including the recognition of Israel behind um, identified borders. The Hamas has given every indication repeatedly they are willing to talk about a, a prolonged truce, maybe as long as 50 years, um, which effectively is peace, um, provided that they, Israel will negotiate with them. They will not. Hamas cannot recognize Israel because Israel doesn't say what its borders are. What is this Israel they are supposed to recognize? Does it include all of Judea and Samaria, including the West Bank? Or does it refer to the, the pre-1967 boundaries, which were basically not so far from the 1948 resolution? It, you, know, you, can't, you can't accept a state which says, we have no boundaries, we'll tell you later. Uh, Professor Kida, uh, people like Professor Rosenhead argue that Israel are not clear on what Israel actually is. So therefore, how can you, how can they be accepted when people don't actually know where Israel starts and where Israel ends? This is not the core problem. The problem is that they don't want us at all in this area. And I'm talking especially about Hamas, because for them, occupation is not Gaza or the West Bank. For them, occupation is Tel Aviv, and Diafo, and Haifa, and of course Jerusalem. They do not recognize any right of the Jews to have any piece of this, of this land, because they view us as Jews, as uh, people who have no right to anywhere in the world, and Professor Rosen must know it before anybody else. And this is why I'm amazed that somebody like uh, Professor Rosen actually supports uh, organizations like Hamas, who couldn't care less about Jews anywhere in the world, not in Tel Aviv and not in London as well, because for them, uh, Jews can live only under Islamic rule, just like Christians. So uh, this is the problem with Hamas. Hamas, although they were uh, allegedly democratically uh, 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 elected, their ways of rule over Gaza is as far as could be from democratic ways of governance. They, uh, they don't accept the ideas of human rights and political freedoms. They kill Christians in the streets only because they are Christians, and Professor Rosen defends them. I'm rather amazed. But I have, with your permission, I would like to pose a question to Professor Rosen. How many missiles would Professor Rosen agree that will fall on London 
from some kind of neighboring state, one a day or two a day or three a day? How many, Professor Rosen, would you agree? Well, per perhaps I could respond to that by uh, asking him a question about how many Israelis would he be willing to have killed uh, per, per year by Hamas. Now, since the 2008 uh, cast-led offensive, um, the Israel has gone on taking, uh, taking Gaza by it with all its military might, selectively every now and again. About 250 inhabitants of Gaza have been killed by the IDF during that period. During the same time, perhaps 10 or 20 Israelis, and it's much to be regretted, have been killed uh, by these very inaccurate, non-explosive rockets. Uh, you know, nobody wants anybody to, to die, but the Israelis don't seem to be the, the world experts at doing it. Well, since you failed to answer my question, I would... Have I you would answered my question? That, that yet you would not, you would never allow any missile to fall on London, because the Londonian people's uh, uh, lives are much more precious in your eyes than us Israelis. How come you agree that, that, uh, that Hamas are launching missiles on the road, not from yesterday, not from 2008. They do it for 12 years already. Thousands of rockets fell on, fell on Israel, on Ashkelon and Sderot, and recently on Tel Aviv and Jerusalem as well. However, you couldn't care less about our lives, and shame on you that you are talking in such a way. However, Professor Kida, a lot of people may argue that whilst a threat to Israel's national security has indeed been incurred, the fact still remains that over the past few years, there have been proportionally more Palestinians killed than Israelis. And perhaps this is the point that Professor Rosenhead is trying to make. A lot of people may argue that how can it be fair that Israel has a very advanced military, has more weapons at its disposal than the opposite side have? How can this be described as a fair or just war in any way, Professor Kida? Well, uh, thanks to the fact that uh, the nations of the world are sleepwalking uh, to see the dangers of Israel, especially from Iran, definitely Israel has to be armed in order, in order to answer dangers like Iran. And believe me, uh, uh, Britain is really sleepwalking to, not to see the uh, arsenal or the nuclear arsenal of Iran. This is why we have to be armed, maybe to our teeth, in order to deter all those from far and from near who are trying to kill us in the buses and everywhere. And unfortunately, there are people who tolerate it, like, like, like Professor Rosen, who couldn't care less about Jews who are killed in, inside Israel. We have to deter our enemies and we have to do whatever we can in order to make sure that we survive in this very very problematic environment as you can see in syria where at least 200 people are butchered every single day and uh, how many people are killed in, in libya in other places and believe me i'm not so sure that the british army which bombed libya a year ago uh, did not have any collateral damage over there in in in, in, in libya and I don't remember Professor Rosen, uh, how he demonstrated on said things against the British Air Force, which so forcibly enforced uh, the, uh, the, the British agenda on Libya. And only when we, the Israelis, try to defend ourselves, uh, people like Professor Rosen uh, uh, criticize us for uh, uh, being forced by Hamas to, to unfortunately kill people who are uh, being where the terrorists are hiding behind them in Gaza. Professor Rosenhead... Well, could, could I, before you ask me a question, can mm. I just make a point? Uh, he said that I couldn't care less about Israelis being killed, where if he was listening, he would have heard me say that all deaths are to be deplored. I haven't heard him making a similar statement. The other, if I may just respond to his other extraordinary wander around uh, the world and the Middle East, he, he's an expert in reframing. Instead of talking about Gaza, he talks about London being bombed from France, he talks about Iran, he talks about Iran's nuclear arsenal, he talks about Libya, he'll talk about anything except Gaza, which is being throttled by a five-year siege by the vastly superior Israelis who have imprisoned 1.7 million Palestinians in an open-air prison and, and, and keeps them on the edge of starvation. Uh, first of all, the, the, all those uh, uh, people in Gaza are as far as could be from, from starvation because every day 200 trucks, lorries, come from Israel into Gaza loaded with food, with whatever they need, and this is always for years. Compared with how many before the siege? Keep repeating 
this uh, this nonsense about hunger in Gaza. There is no hunger in Gaza. However, Professor, however, Professor Kida, is it not a fact that actually somebody in connection to the Israeli government, in fact, leaked documents did suggest that the people of Gaza are being kept on a diet, and I quote that word, diet. Surely these documents that were leaked from close sources in the Israeli government can't have been inaccurate in what they have stated. The fact that the people of Gaza, it could be argued, are being kept not in a state of starvation, but on the brink of starvation, which is something that uh, you have been accused of, your government has been accused of by Palestinians and pro-Palestinian activists on a regular basis, and something that they argue leaked documents from the Israeli government have actually suggested. Uh, these documents, first of all, are from years ago. Secondly, these are scientific uh, 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 documents dealing with the quantity of how much uh, people need in the size of place like, like Gaza. And uh, just in order, exactly in order, to uh, refrain from any uh, hunger in this place. So to refrain this, uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, these, these documents in the way which Professor Rosen and you, you are trying, this is definitely as far as to be from the reality. However, I must, I must uh, say, uh, Gaza is surrounded not only by Israel, Egypt as well. And Egypt has this Rafah uh, crossroad, which, which uh, is closed for some unknown reason. For, for, uh, from our point of view, Gaza could become part of Egypt, and there is, will be no problem. However, the Egyptians are no less than Israel part of the siege on Gaza, and they exactly know why, because they do not want the terror from Gaza to spill into Sinai and into Egypt. And they, exa they know exactly what goes in Gaza, which became a hub of terrorists, of Al-Qaeda activists. And, and, and don't, don't, don't forget that those Pakistanis who came to Israel and they killed some Israelis in the Mike Space restaurant, visited Gaza before they came to, to Israel, after they came from Britain. So definitely, uh, Gaza is a hub of terrorists and should be treated as such. Although those terrorists are hiding b behind uh, 1.5 million people, we are not responsible for this. We give them food, but we cannot educate them to uh, throw those terrorists away. We tried our, our best to target the terrorists who are hiding behind men and women. <laughs> this is what happens in Gaza. <laughs> and I must, add, I must add another very important point. We, the Israelis, we discovered a whole gas field in the sea some 12 years ago, and we gave it to the Palestinians for free in 1998, 14 years ago. And the Palestinians did nothing in order to take out the gas and to turn Gaza into a, 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 the richest emirate in the world. British Gas, the company, the British company, British Gas, is waiting for the contracts to come and start digging into the, into the oil which belongs to the Palestinians. Why didn't they do it until this very day? They could spread money all over the world from what they got in, in, in the sea, which Israel gave them for free, for free. So this, this is so question. bizarre. Maybe Professor Rosen has some explanation for this. Professor Rosenhead, please yes. do respond to those points. And also another question that I would like to ask you whilst you are responding is the fact that a lot of people may argue, especially people like Professor Kida may argue, that Israel is constantly talked about being the vile... Um, actor in conducting truly unacceptable actions. However, is it not a fact that before the establishment of the State of Israel, for over 19 years, people like Professor Kida argue the Egyptians had Gaza under siege? Um, I think it's more that they have, they cooperated under Mubarak with the Israeli government to keep the 1.7 million uh, Palestinians there. The, Mubarak was that sort of regime. It's not a question of, uh, um, of Egyptians wanting uh, d to maintain um, uh, the, the situation as he describes it. So it's certainly true that the Egyptians don't want uh, the Palestinians, not because they are terrorists, but because they are Palestinians. The Palestinians don't want to be in Egypt. They want their, to, their rights to their own land and to be able to trade and work usually. Uh, the Israelis, I was on a little boat that went from Cyprus to Gaza. Uh, we were challenged um, by the Israeli Navy. Subsequently, the same boat was rammed by an Israeli gunboat. Is it, the, the Israelis will not let the Palestinians in, in Gaza develop gas and become rich and powerful. Of course they won't. That's the, the whole idea is to keep the, the Palestinians 
powerless and weak and out the, out the control, in the control of the Israelis. What about this argument, uh, Professor Rosenhead, that actually, in Professor Kida's opinion, these, uh, the Israelis are not forcing the people of Gaza into starvation. It is not true that they are being deprived of the basic supplies for survival. What would be your response to that, Professor Rosenhead? Well, I'm astonished because Professor Kida is, as I understand it, after 25 years in the IDF, he's still a reserve lieutenant colonel in military intelligence, so he must have access to all of this information. He knows that the number of lorries coming in from Israel with, with supplies of food is, um, is down to about one-fifth of what it was before Israel declared its siege. I mean, he knows that, and I don't know why he isn't telling you it. Professor Kida, a lot of people may say that there are figures that have been released from the United Nations showing that over 90% of the water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption. People have accused Israel of not even allowing the basics of clean water into that particular part of the region. Surely, Professor Kida, the Israeli government, or indeed those that sympathize with it, cannot disagree with these figures that come from the likes of the UN. Well, let me give you some news. We in Israel, 70% of the water which we drink are desalinated uh, because of the population in Israel and the very poor resources of this region. The same should have been in Gaza because they could use the gas which Israel gave them for free in order to desalinate water just like what we do in Israel. And again I ask, and, and definitely we have no, no problem with the Gazans who will start taking out the gas from the, from the sea and become very rich uh, emirates of gas, like Dubai or like, uh, like Qatar or Abu Dhabi, and they definitely can do whatever they like. We have no problem. Uh, on the contrary, we would uh, uh, encourage them to do this and maybe help them as well with Israeli technology, how to desalinate water just like what we do. The fact that uh, they uh, uh, have uh, polluted the water is because those Hamas who took over Gaza five and a, year, and a half years ago, they could not care less about their own population. This is why they couldn't care less about the, uh, the, the fact that Gaza is, is underdeveloped. This is why they don't take the gas out of the, out, out of the sea. This is why all, the only thing which they care about is how to kill Israelis, how to launch missiles, and how to, to wage wars against Israel. However, could, can I just say, Professor Kida li lives in a parallel universe. The, he represents the Israel and the, and the IDF. They were the people that bombed the electricity power station, reducing the, water, the electricity which could be used to purify the water. They had good water until Israel attacked the power plant. And, and, and what, how could Gaza desalinate water when it doesn't have the electricity because the Israelis won't let them have it? First of all, some 60% of electricity in Gaza comes from Israel. And but if we did not give them electricity, they would sit in the dark. Exactly, you can cut it off any time you like. They could develop whatever they like. We don't force our, our uh, electricity on them. They are begging us to, to, to keep, give them water and food and, and, and electricity. Why, how come they don't develop by themselves? What, what prevents them? However, Professor Kida, a lot of people may argue that as Israel has had Gaza and the Palestinians in general under siege for many years, and even after Israel has stated that it has withdrawn said siege, it has still, it could be argued, maintained many restrictions upon the people of Palestine, making it therefore practically impossible for the Palestinians to have a sense of self-sufficiency. My dear brother, everything which the Gazans need, they can get from Israel, either imported through Ashdod or from other harbors, and they can get whatever they like, as long as it's not missiles and weapons and, and the explosives. Definitely, Israel would support them in everything. Even the Marmara, the Mavi Marmara, the, the, the ship which was uh, attacked by Israel, we, again and again, we offered them to come to Ashdod, and whatever human uh, aid which they had could uh, pass through Israel after being checked that there are no missiles and no weapons. What is the problem? Where is the problem? They could have whatever they, li whatever they like if they only wanted to live in peace with us. But the problem is that they do not want, especially since Hamas took, Hamas took, uh, took Gaza over and, and surprisingly there are bleeding hearts like Professor Rosen who support them. Professor Rosenhead, the people of Palestine, the people of Gaza could have everything they want. 
only if they stopped attacking Israel, they wanted to live with the Israelis in peace. Your final concluding comment to that comment, please. Yes. What, what he's saying is they could have everything, everything they liked if only they stopped protesting about being uh, kept as, in an open-air prison. As it is, there's a list of hundreds and hundreds of items which may not be brought in. For years, after much of Gaza was destroyed in the cast lead operation, they refused any construction uh, stuff. So any construction stuff that, uh, for rebuilding that came in had to come in through the tunnels. Much more expensive, much more difficult. Um, it's not that they can have anything they like. They can have anything that Israel decides at its, at its whim to give them or to withhold. This is not a way in which our free people can live. Of course, Professor Mordechai Keda would strongly disagree. We'll have to leave it there, but Professor Jonathan Rosenhead from the London School of Economics and Political Science and Professor Mordechai Keda joining us live on the line from Israel. Thank you both very much for joining us on 